Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, for the record, could you please uh, state your name and the uh, position you hold in the organisation, starting from Vikram? Vikram Naya, I'm a member of the PAP Policy Forum. Benjamin Tay, uh, Chairman, PAP Policy Forum Council. Jude Tan, uh, P Councillor, PAP Policy Forum. Sujatha Salva Kumar, PAP Council Member. Thank you. Uh, uh, the evidence which you, which you will be giving today before the committee <coughs> will be taken on affirmation. Uh, the clerk will now issue a minister the oath. I, I Benjamin Tan, swear that the evidence which I shall, shall give before, before this committee shall be the, be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing, and nothing but the truth. So, so help me God. I, Vikram Nair, do solemnly and sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence which I shall give before this committee shall, shall be the truth, the whole, the whole truth, truth, and nothing, and nothing but, but the truth. Uh, thank you. Uh, please be seated. Uh, welcome to the public hearing on the Select Committee on Deliberate Online Falsehoods. Uh, the focus of uh, today's evidence gathering session is for us to put questions to you. You have taken a solemn obligation to answer our questions truthfully. And I will now call on uh, Edwin to lead the questions. Hi, good afternoon all of you. Thank you for waiting. I think uh, you had a bit of delay in our schedule when we overran. Um, you have a copy of your report in front of you? Yes. What I propose to do is to take you through parts of the report and ask you to elaborate and explain at certain junctures. Um, but before that, just some o overarching points. I think you all accept, I, I gather from your report, that falsehoods should be something that should not be part of the information landscape whatsoever, correct? Yes. And the question then is, where these falsehoods then come and undermine national security interests, social cohesion, that's when it begins to be very threatening. Would you agree? Yes. Yes. And in that context, I mean, you referred at um, paragraph two of your report to a Human Rights Watch report mm. titled Kill the Chickens, Kill the Chicken to Scare the Monkeys, as an, as an example of how a foreign funded NGO can both rely on and use falsehoods to advocate political change in another country, right? Yes. That's something that is, has a potential, uh, potentially serious risk for Singapore, correct? Yes. yes. Now, if you look at um, page two, same page, uh, paragraph three, okay, there's no paragraph four, but so three and five, these two paragraphs. What you're saying here is that HRW in their report has used false and fabricated allegations in its political discourse. And the purpose of doing that is to sow seeds of doubt on uh, national issues and government relations with various institutions of the country. Right? Would you care to elaborate on some of them in the context of what you say here, as well as over the next couple of pages? from paragraphs 9 through to 17. If you just quickly cast your eye over it. Just by way of some examples, elaborate on them. Yes, OK. Um, so basically, I think the examples that we cited, and certainly that this report cited, was attempting to legitimize um, examples that were clearly false. Right, so the examples included uh, Roy Ngang's case that the Prime Minister misappropriated funds, Ellen Shadrick's allegation that the courts uh, and prosecutors conspired to hang innocent defendants, and you know, the attacks on foreigners with fabricated facts, which uh, TRS perpetuated. And the HRW report seemed to suggest that all this was okay, that these people should not have been prosecuted, and this was all legitimate part of discourse. Um, but we're, of course, of the view that uh, false news, in fact, undermines public discourse. Um, and I think the committee has heard, and we've obviously read in the news about the witnesses uh, that came earlier on, and it's quite clear that false news, in fact, is very attractive, it's very sensational, and even you know, TRS made a lot of money out of it enough 
uh, to buy private property in Australia, right, which is fake news. Mm. So this is clearly a concern, um, and this is um, and the biggest concern, of course, is that the assumption, of course, and you know, even I had this assumption when I was a teenager, was that the truth will always prevail, but the facts just don't bear that out. Well, so. in fact, I think other experts have told us that the truth always is always several steps behind yes. the false information. Yes. Yes, and certainly the government's green paper, you know, all the examples given there of how uh, basically the lies, you know, trumped the facts in many of the elections and all that was certainly worrying. Right. I'd like to ask you to look down to page, okay, there isn't a page number, so paragraph 31, mm -hmm. where you make the point here that the spread of deliberate falsehoods would seriously affect democracies, undermine national institutions, <laughs> change values for the worse. Yes. And at paragraph 33, the HRW reports an example of how false and misleading impressions created by selective presentation of facts promote an underlying agenda to undermine a well-functioning society. Uh, and bear in mind that the HRW report that we talk about is specific to Singapore. Yes. And at paragraph 34, uh, to give legitimacy to the process, uh, HRW has described itself and also presented itself as uh, an independent and objective human rights watchdog. Uh, but you make the point here at paragraph 34 that when you take a closer look, it is not transparent, mm -hmm. and that um, you say at paragraph 37 that whilst it tries to cast itself as an objective and well-researched critique, a closer look reveals a biased and flawed methodology. Could I invite you to explain and elaborate on this, these propositions, please. Sure. So, uh, I mean, Human Rights Watch, I think, is an NGO that has been around for a very long time. Um, but of course, when you look close at it, you realize that you don't really know where it's getting its money from. Uh, you don't really know how it you know, monetizes, uh, how it hires people, who are the ones writing the individual articles. Yes. And what was most damning, I think, uh, was you know, its uh, longtime founder, Robert Bernstein, also joined its critics. Um, uh, I think around 2009 in particular, saying that its coverage of the Middle East was extremely biased, right, mm -hmm. in that particular case against Israel. And you know, to me, looking at this report, it seems to be very much in line with that. You present a one-sided story, you interview 34 people, you don't put any evidence on the other side, and based on this interview, you have an article that reads, you know, superficially it reads, you know, nicely, but of course, what it leaves out is vital, right? Including the evidence that goes on the other side, um, the reasons that these people had findings made against them. Mm -hmm. So, in that sense, it's a you know it's a report that completely lacks objectivity. Its funding sources are obscure, and its fundamental thrust, and this is what we had the most discomfort with, is that falsehoods are all right, right? That you know all these people engaging in deliberate falsehoods were right to do it, and the government was somehow wrong, or the authorities were wrong, or the courts were wrong to come down on it. And, you know, I mean, to me, this is, it's basically saying that even our existing laws to tackle deliberate falsehoods are too harsh, when in fact, I think our existing laws are insufficient. I understand. Paragraph 37C in particular, you then cite some other studies that were done by third parties, germane to the issues which are covered by HRW in the report. Yes. And at D, you then say that it does not mention these third party sources. Can you just briefly comment on that? So, uh, I mean, if you read the HRW report, it basically starts from the premise that the Singapore government is not trusted, it's an oppressive regime, and it uses a whole variety of institutions to uh, undermine you know, contrary speech and so on. Um, but in fact, I mean, the example that we cited was the Edelman Trust Barometer, and, you know, it, this is an objective, uh, I think, commercially run organization which has a long history in uh, this kinds of research, and they've said the trust in the Singapore government is at 65% and media is 52%. Um, but you know, if you contrast that to places like the US and the UK, um, the trust in government was 33 and 36%, so significantly lower, um, just over half of that in Singapore. And interestingly, trust in the media was also lower, 42% for the US and 32% for the UK. And this is clearly evidence that goes the other way from an objective source that you know, any neutral or independent minded organization should have put forward. Were, were these third-party pieces of information or studies cited in the report? Uh, no, not as far as I know. I've looked at it, yes. All right. Um, 
Can you move on to paragraph 38? Yes. <laughs> I think you mentioned these examples earlier. Uh, unless, yes. Unless there was anything else you wish to add to it, I will... Um, I could move no, on. in fact, those are the exact examples those, that I elaborated on earlier. Those are the examples, yes. okay. Just have a look at your concluding remarks, paragraph 39. You say that it, the report deliberately paints a misleading, misleading picture of Singapore. Yes. It does so by carefully selecting 34 individuals who do not represent what most Singaporeans experience. HRW also carefully omits facts which are inconvenient. Paragraph 40, individual falsehoods are all the more egregious because it is perpetuated under the guise of objectivity and independence, which HRW tries to project. The misleading picture is painted by HRW to serve its underlying agenda, which is to change Singapore society in the way it desires. Can you comment on those two paragraphs? Sure. So, I mean, the HRW report was, um, you know, put online, and obviously there'll be many people who think this is an independent NGO commenting on Singapore. It's a long report, and there are very specific recommendations on things that need to be changed, and it advocates that with you know, this selective use of examples, right? No proper evaluation. So it is clearly a piece in advocacy. Would, would you say that the use of uh, the label as an NGO is designed to lend some degree of credibility to the report? Um, well, I think the NGO existed before the report came out, but certainly that does lend credibility, and that is a concern, because NGOs, you know, like in this case, which advocate the use of deliberate falsehoods, are a concern. Mm. All right. Paragraph 44, I think it's the last paragraph here. You say it's been the HRW report as a type of deliberate falsehood yes. is becoming increasingly <laughs> prevalent and easily put online can be widely circulated with or without attribution, and it can influence opinions, impede fair, honest debate on issues. I just want to get your comment on that. So I was going to say, I mean, you know, if um, the news on Cambridge Analytics came out before we wrote this paper, that would likely have been the focus as a case study, right? Um, because there it's so clear, so transparent that there is money involved. Uh, organizations gather data, use data to affect change in other countries. Right. Um, and, you know, it's clear that this is just one example of a much larger practice, right? And especially where it may even be that the organization itself is subverted, right? Because it doesn't know who it's getting its fundings from, particular pieces of research may be funded. And, you know, this is entirely possible where, you know, money flow into organizations is not transparent, origins of news is not transparent, but sensational stories get circulated regardless of origin. Right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I've got no further questions. Yes, Ms. Chia, go ahead. Uh, thank you, gen lady and gentlemen. Um, thank you for coming and sharing your views. And um, I read your submission. It appears to me uh, that it is primarily directed at HRW. So you have, of course, um, um, explained uh, you know, your suspicions and also your, the reasons for your conclusions. Um, however, I, I just want to be very clear. Uh, can you share again what is the relevance of your um, submission to the Select Committee's deliberation on deliberate online falsehood? Um, so, I, I think two points there. I think the Select Committee's terms of reference uh, include the phenomenon of using digital technology to deliberately spread online falsehoods. So all the examples that the HRW report cited were deliberate online falsehoods. Now, these were falsehoods that are already illegal under existing laws, but they were, of course, advocating that, you know, existing laws are too tough even in taking this out. So that's the first limb. And the second is um, the motivations and reasons for spreading such falsehoods, right? Uh, and the types of individuals and entities, both local and foreign, which engage in such activities. So this is the second limb of the Select Committee's report. And this is, I think, an example of an entity that is outside Singapore, whose motivations are unclear, but which is you know, generally putting forward information to change laws in Singapore. But which, in your view, could be uh, state-sponsored uh, or funded by... Well, state we don't players? know who. I don't think it has to be funded by state players, but even if a foreign private organization, say like Cambridge Analytics, is doing it for private profit, right, to change our politics, I would still have concerns about that because they may then be engaged by state actors. Um, their motivation would be private profits, but if a state actor pays them to do something, they will do it. 
And what is your view on the impact of this? Do you think Singaporeans will take the report seriously? So, and this is what, you know, is amazing, right? Because if you look at, say, the government's green paper, right, even in developed countries like the US, the last US election, what they said is that 40% of the news that was circulated was fake news. Um, and this is excluding social media, right? If you put in social media, it'd be an even larger number. Um, countries like the UK, Germany, you know, in all these countries, Italy, there was evidence of elections being influenced by fake news. So I don't think that, you know, we are any more sophisticated than that. And, you know, I mean, I have to say, even I was taken in by fake news more than once, um, because unless you verify, you know, a story that leaps out, that looks credible, and in my case, I can say, you know, it came from WhatsApp, from trusted friends, right? So it looked like a credible source. But then, you know, when you probe a bit deeper, think a bit harder, you realize it's not. But my friend obviously thought it was credible and circulated it. So I don't think we are any more immune. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, if there are no more questions, uh, I would like to thank uh, all of you for taking time to share your views with us and also presenting it before the Select Committee. Uh, we will send you a transcript of uh, today's events. Uh, if there are any corrections or amendments to be made, please do so and send it back to us. Okay, once again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh,